Welcome, welcome, welcome to the deal room. This is my debut. This isn't Anthony. If you're not watching on YouTube, Piers Curran here, stepping in for Anthony Chung to join Stephen uh, to chat all things M and A. Uh, so, welcome to the latest episode. Hi, Stephen. How's, how's it going? Yeah, pretty well. Good to uh, good to see you, Piers. I was just discussing. We've just dated our our stitch. Now I've got the newest version of the Amplify T-shirt, which I'm quite proud of. I've actually been wearing it every day this week. Uh, and you've got the old one. Like, well, what's going on there? Yeah. Well, you know, as I said, I like to go retro every now and then. I've actually got, I think, I'm the only owner of the original Amplify T-shirt, which dates back over a decade. I, I'm pretty sure not even Will has one of those. So um, as collectible items go, um that's right up there i would say um yeah, valuable so you, yeah yeah i think that's a good asset that we could probably borrow against in the future we can probably talk about that a little bit later on yes indeed but look let's <laughs> talk let, let me um let me lay out the uh sort of well kind of three broad talking points for today um so we're going to talk well jd uh this is a chinese you know monster conglomerate and well, they've decided to split up, split up into seven different parts. It kind of suspiciously, in some ways, comes on the on the coattails of Alibaba um, announcing pretty much the exact same thing a few days prior, where they're looking to break up into six uh, parts. So, yeah, we're going to talk about, you know, I guess, unlocking value through spin outs, but, you know, thinking about the logic of conglomerates and, and, and this thing called verticalization, and then the logic of breakups and spin outs, and does it make sense? Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll discuss and tackle that. Number two, uh, we're going to go UK mobile phone networks. You might have heard in the news that Vodafone is looking to merge with the with, with three. Uh, three is actually owned by a, a company called CK Hutchinson. Um, Hong Kong based company, actually. But look, these two are looking to, to merge. The issue is this will create, well, the world's, uh, sorry, the world's, uh, the UK's biggest mobile network. If they did merge, I think they'd have 28 million customers. So, yeah, I would love your thoughts, Stephen, on what this means in terms, you know, from the, well, the regulators and the competition commission's point of view. And, you know, really what size market what size market share is appropriate and, and what you know is it a good thing for the uk mobile phone network that we get such a giant um player or not and, and will it get through the uh, the regulators um scrutiny or not uh, and then finally we're gonna chomp into a bit of subway and you know talk uh buyouts because We've got certain suitors uh, weighing up, I think it's a 3 billion securitization um, sort of buyout fund. So we're going to talk about that and really delve into things like capital structure and, and use this as a sort of case study to, you know, talk about leverage financing uh, and so on. So there are kind of three big topics, but yeah, let, let's talk, um, let's talk JD. And, and before you wade into it, there's a there's a thing called 618, which is a Chinese shopping day. You might have heard of Singles Day, which is the number one uh, retail event of the year in China. Singles Day, I think, is that in November? Correct me if I'm wrong. Am I right in saying it's in November? I'm You're not right, sure. yeah. I think it is. But um, and and this is the day where yeah, comfortably the the largest amount of um, money gets spent on online shopping. Just behind that, in terms of um, biggest shopping days of the year, is this 618 day. It's the 18th of June. And again, it's used as this kind of monster kind of marketing excuse uh, for the e-commerce giants to um, run campaigns and try and drive traffic to their sites and get people snapping up bargains and, uh, and kind of stuff like this. It's, it's a bit genius, I have to say, because JD um, are behind this 618 thing phenomenon it's actually their anniversary as a company they were founded in 1998 uh, by this guy called Liu Guangdong 
and they were founded June the 18th, 1998. And um, they managed to kind of basically use their birthday as an excuse to flog a load of stuff at cut down yeah. prices. <laughs> and it kind of gathered momentum to the point where, they, where all other retailers then jumped on the bandwagon. And it's just exploded to become this kind of massive uh, sort of national annual event. But um, but yeah, so JD are, are kind of behind that big event, which was, of course, earlier this week. So they've used this anniversary um, to also make a big announcement. Um, so what are they up to? They're going to break yeah. up. What's going on? No, no, good. Uh, I didn't know that about the, uh, the the 618. So that's really interesting. It reminds me of the of the invention of Valentine's Day. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if it's apocryphal, but you know the marketing executives in 1950s America th- thinking we need to generate some cash between Christmas, that dead spot between Christmas and Easter. Right. Let's 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 create something. So pretty genius, yeah. as you said. But this is, yeah, this is, I love this story because it's, you know, it's a story of conglomerates. And it's also a story that links back to if you did economics at A level or, you know, even at university, this is all about economies of scale. And it's all about um, specialization and focus and, and all of these really interesting business principles. So, you know, a little bit of background on what a conglomerate is and kind of some examples of pretty famous conglomerates. So a conglomerate is essentially a holding company, a company that sits above a number of different subsidiaries that are either wholly or partially owned by the holding company that can exist in almost every different or any different industry. So the traditional old school conglomerate my favorite example is, uh, you know, the Hong Kong conglomerate, Swire and Jardines. So Swire, it's an old school conglomerate that sits atop Cathay Pacific, which is an airline, Swire Properties, which is a property company. They own a shipping division. They own um, Bar Park Forecourts and, and um, our sales distributors. You know, what is the rationale between this diverse mix, this hodgepodge of different industries? You can even say Berkshire Hathaway is a bit of a conglomerate in that sense, right? Yeah. The reason why you would find conglomerates potentially quite attractive as a kind of holding company, kind of two reasons. Firstly, you have access to capital at a cheaper price because you're a bigger entity and therefore you can borrow cheaply and distribute down to any part of that holding company that you wish. Obviously, there are, there are potential issues with where you put that money. But you have these economies of scale, you know, in terms of the cash flow going up to the holding company. The second is diversification. If Cathay Pacific's not doing well one year, then maybe it will get counterbalanced by Swire Properties doing very well the next year. So you've got this kind of portfolio element as an owner, as a holding company, it's quite attractive. So <laughs> to bring it forward to JD.com, you know, it's exactly the same story with Alibaba. You start off with a really nice kernel of a business, the e-commerce business, right? Uh, and then, you know, as you grow, as you get more excited about scale, as you, uh, as you recognize different areas of opportunity in different adjacent business, business areas, you start thinking, well, you know, I've done this job pretty well. Why don't I just start a business here? You know, why don't I just start a logistics business? Why don't I just start a health business? Why don't I just start a property business? Why don't I just start an industrial business? You know, and these are all businesses that JD.com has started. But there comes a point where sound business sense, you know, if I'm an e-commerce company, maybe it makes a lot of sense to own a logistics company because I'm owning a different chunk of the supply chain chain and taking margin. But does it really make sense to own an industrials company? You know, is that too adjacent to be core to the business model and also the pitch that you make to investors as they're looking to invest in you and obviously increase the share price? So JD.com and Alibaba have basically become kind of slightly ugly monsters in in the sense that they've got these sprawling business units employing hundreds of thousands actually over a million people 
right. and there's not necessarily a lot of logic to some of these business units. And Piers, you'll know this really well. If I'm an investor, I probably got a remit or a mandate or a sector or a theme that I'm looking at. Right. You know, with, you know, a company needs to have minimum percentage revenues in X area in order for me to kind of include it in my universe. These big conglomerates start looking a little bit unwieldy and they start falling out of buckets instead of into buckets. Yeah. Furthermore, what happens, you know, this happens across startups and big businesses. What happens when you're basically running seven businesses, you lose focus. So what's happened with JD.com and Alibaba, and we might counterpoint this to Amazon uh, in, a, in, a, in a separate discussion, what's happened with JD.com and Alibaba is, you know, due to macro events, but also due to internal business model, their share prices have absolutely fallen off down 60, 70% since highs in 2021. Now, again, that's partly macro, but that is partly because investors are trying to figure out where growth is coming from. So when JD announced that it is spinning its business into seven different business units, all majoritively owned by the holding company. So this isn't them getting rid of the family silver, this is them creating these individual, nimbler, leaner business units that can go out, you know, IPO, raise separate funds, you know, be hungry and take market share in those businesses. When they announced that they were splitting and spinning off, you know, getting rid of maybe the diseconomies of scale that they were seeing, JD.com share price popped by 7%. Alibaba's, when they announced it, it actually popped by 14%. So investors mm -hmm. are kind of, breathing a sigh of relief and going, suddenly you're doing something that makes sense and potentially unlocking a lot of value because these are good businesses just in a relatively unwieldy structure. Okay. So the, I, okay. So like when you see a headline like Alibaba or, or JD are breaking up into seven entities. Okay. When you get under the skin of it, and that's not actually, so if the holding company maintains majority ownership of the new seven entities then i guess it's the best of both worlds in so much as they're retaining those some of those economies of scale elements not just from a i guess a well i don't know a financing point of view would each of the seven entities now go out and raise funds individually maybe they would maybe they wouldn't but i guess that there are other economies of scale factors like you know you can have centralized functions right and so i assume they can retain you know functions like i don't know hr or uh, finance or whatever and, and maybe they can retain all the good stuff on the economies of scale but then they won't suffer from yeah they kind of fall out of these sector buckets because they're too unwieldy as you said so yeah i guess i guess i guess make makes sense so what i'm what well, i got two questions i guess number mm -hmm. one is well why now and, and i'm a bit suspicious why is it like literally within sort of three days of each other alibaba and jd have made pretty much the exact same announcement so so what is it about june 2023 that has suddenly triggered both to pull the trigger on this yeah, it's a really interesting question, and it's one that I'm certainly not uh, an expert on, but there's definitely a macro element to this. Yeah. You know? So over the last few months, China, which has been shunning tech and kind of closing its door to these big, you know, slightly maybe too, too big to control tech companies um, within the country, it started to kind of reopen the door and to invite Jack Ma back from where he, wherever he was staying uh, and starting to be a bit more business friendly, right? And I think probably the pro quo, you know, one can speculate that the reason why the door was shut on the likes of Jack Ma was because there was a concern that he was becoming bigger than the state and a bit, a bit of a yeah. statesman-like figure. You know, if he comes back and says, not necessarily groveling, but saying, look, actually, would bring you more favor if we created a slightly more decentralized structure with individual CEOs and individual boards of directors IPOing with their separate entity, would this make you feel more comfortable? And would this make you feel more inclined towards supporting e-commerce and tech businesses? 
you know, that is a pretty compelling argument to the Chinese government. So, you know, maybe there's a macro element to this. I'm sure there's a lot of investor pressure. A lot of people bought into JD.com and Alibaba, you know, a few years ago. Uh, and, you know, it's listed in the US, you know, it's dual listed. So, you know, US investors are thinking, where's my 70% gone? Um, yeah. You know, it used to be trading at X, now it's 70% off. There's going to be investor pressure. Hence why you saw both stocks jumping on the announcement. It just seems like good news yeah. if, and only if, well, it, can be done, it can be done successfully. Well, that's it. I mean, it sounds good on paper and share prices pop, but I mean, what are the risks? I'm sure there's some pitfalls along the way here in terms of execution. Yeah, it's really interesting. So we talk in the world of M&A about synergies, right? So when one company acquires another company, we, <laughs> we're very good on our spreadsheets to, to create these synergies from combining two entities, right? You know, post synergies, we might be able to combine our HR function, as you mentioned, we might be able to combine, combine our head office function, shut mothball one industrial manufacturing plant because we've got this bigger, more efficient one, and you save money and you add to your bottom line. When you're talking about a breakup or spin-offs, the danger is you have the inverse of that, right? Yeah. You've created synergies by unifying centralized functions, and then you're going to have to, you know, from a regulatory and a governance perspective, you're going to have to start to create these individual functions within these seven businesses. And suddenly the profit that you see at a top co or a holding co level you know, which is, you know, which is relatively, relatively strong. I mean, JD.com's profits, you know, only $3 billion a year, but it's still in a kind of aggressive growth phase of its business. Suddenly you'll see that, at least in the first few years, you'll see that drop across the business units. But hopefully it will be more than made up with, with renewed focus and, you know, uh, and a hunt for market share and things like that. So I'd say that that, you know, that has got to be, it, it's hard to break these things apart. And it's going to cost money. Yeah. Well, I guess now you mentioned their profit, because I think revenues are 150 billion, right? Mm -hmm. And they only, they only generate around 3 billion of profit. That's a wafer thin <laughs> margin. Yeah. Right? So when you start saying this could cost a bit to kind of, you know, one off costs fine, but still to kind of execute this. So yeah, there's not a lot of room there on the sort of bottom line to to execute this with it without having a year of loss of losses. Yeah, and, and, and it's a good opportunity to bring Amazon here. You know, maybe to yeah. bring this this little piece to a close. To Amazon, Amazon is a brilliant case study of a kind of semi conglomerate through verticalization, lots of jargon in there, right? So <laughs> Amazon has been the most amazing company looking at its costs. You know, I can just imagine Bezos back in the day going, you know, why are we paying so much for data centers? You know, why are we paying so much for, for cloud computing? Why don't we do it ourselves? Yeah. Why are we paying so much for distribution? Why don't we do it ourselves? And actually, Amazon's margin on e, uh, a profit margin on e-commerce is way for thin. Yeah. It's really, really hard. You know, you know, they were loss making for over 20 years, but it's by verticalizing, by basically owning margin throughout the supply chain, Amazon has been able to jump its profit margin. We all know that AWS, Amazon Web Services, is the key driver of growth for that company. So it's kind of, they, they own a lot of different business units but they're all contributing to the margin and also contributing to the kind of logic of the business model. So it's just quite an interesting way. You know, you can do it well and you can certainly do it badly. Yeah. Well, interesting stuff. Well, look, let's shift across from China. Uh, let's bring it home. And well, let's bring it semi home because I guess we're going to have one foot still a little bit over in the, the, the Far East with the fact that Vodafone and three merging. I, I didn't quite realize, maybe we'll touch on this, not immediately, but CK Hutchinson is a, is a Hong Kong based business. So I don't know if there's any a, a political element to all of this from the regulator's point of view, but before we kind of perhaps talk about the politics of it all. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting one. I guess they've been trying to 
there's been there's been I, I guess um, ambitions of consolidation, sort of right up the top of the tree of the UK's mobile network space for a long time, and it's never quite happened. And so I guess this is this is the latest episode. So yeah, talk, talk me through it. Vodafone and three merging. What's the rationale? Yeah. Uh, will it happen? Will it happen? Yeah, well, we can definitely talk about regulation. Uh, that's a big part of this story. And, you know, and we can talk about natural monopolies and oligopolies and things like that. All good stuff that we all remember studying uh, way back in the day. Just a little bit of a highlight on the deal, because it's, you know, it was probably the major deal that was announced last week. So this yeah. is a 15 billion pound deal to merge Vodafone UK. This is not Vodafone PLC. Vodafone PLC, you know, operates across the world and, and generates a lot of its revenue in the EU. Vodafone UK and three, which is a subsidiary of Hutchison, which is the Hong Kong uh, listed uh, conglomerate, you know, going back to conglomerates. So this is a £15 deal where the equity of the two businesses is, go is valued at £9 billion and £6 billion uh, of the enterprise value of the deal is going from debt from the existing entities fed into this merged entity. Again, enterprise value is not just the equity value, it's also the value of the And this becomes debt. a brand new, new entity. It becomes a brand new entity. Um, it is going to be owned 51% by Vodafone. And there's a reason why there's 51% yeah. ownership by Vodafone, which... Which, which we can talk to a little bit later with regards to regulation, and 49% from Hutchison. And the rationale, you know, we'll talk a little bit about this rationale. So Vodafone, I don't know if you followed this story, but over the last year or two, there's been an activist shareholder campaign uh, basically saying, look, Vodafone, you're, you're, <laughs> you're not performing anywhere near what we expect you to be performing at. You're still investing money into loss-making businesses. You're not focusing on the real jewels in the crown of your business, which is basically Germany, UK, Spain, et cetera. And A, we want to get your CEO out because we don't think he's good enough. This is right. Nick Reed. B, Nick Reed's been responsible for a 20% decline in the share price. So do something. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, Vodafone had to make some moves, right? And by merging with three, what, you're, what they're trying to do is create an entity that's got the firepower to invest across the 5, 5G spectrum, which is, the again, the big land grab in this industry, a bigger entity with more ability to raise capital and get, receive investment from the parent companies is going to give them a war chest to go out and not compete, EE, et cetera, in this market, they also say that uh, the deal is going to unlock to, this is quite staggering, the deal is going to unlock up to £7 billion in synergies. Right. So £7 billion in synergies, when you think about an equity value of a, or an enterprise value of a business of £15 billion, you're basically saying that this is going to be the world's greatest value creator <laughs> <laughs> um, by just unlocking all of these amazing synergies from things like you know marketing unification uh, enhanced mass sharing capabilities which is something that the industry does quite a lot of right. so you know again who knows where that number came from and often these numbers are whatever they need to be in order to work from a deal rationale perspective but i think that that is going to be you know I can't Sounds see seven billion coming out of you know coming out too quickly. That's ambitious. Sounds like a lot of job losses. There is going to be some job losses. Yeah, and I think they actually the regulators be... might feed into the kind of regulators' um, list of things to uh, be concerned about here. Yeah, this is really interesting. We can move on to we can move on to regulation, and as you said, there have been four big players in the in the market, in the mobile yeah. phone operator market, EE023 uh, and Vodafone. It, already that's a quite a concentrated market when it comes to choice, consumer yeah. choice. Um, and back in 2016, the EU regulators blocked just first attempt 
um, to link three with O2. They said four is okay, three is too small a market to give consumers the choice that they need. But there are certain markets, there are certain markets that are naturally oligopolistic. That's or actually, a, that's a great word, by the way. Can you, can you just say that? Saying, I try and say it about 10 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so an oligopoly is, is a market with three or four major players. And sometimes that is a bad thing because it restricts competition, which, you know, and prices are driven up and consumers don't get choice. But often these markets, as goes the argument from Vodafone and Hutchison, these markets can only support three or four big players. Because in order to be a big player in this market, you need scale. Yeah. You, know, you need to be a national operator with the infrastructure capabilities to run this network. You need to have access to significant capital able to improve your network through time there are not that many companies subscale companies will not survive in this industry and what Hutchison's saying is look, since 2019 we've been operating our profits have been below cost of capital so cost of capital how much it costs to raise new money our profits are not basically covering that yeah that is a clear example of a subscale business and what they're basically saying is, you know, if you don't let us do this, then it will be three anyway, because we'll just, we won't be able to survive. Yeah. So, you know, regulators take a little look at this. And by the way, we are committed to investing 11 billion pounds in the 5G network, which you're already lagging the US and other countries in. So right. come on, please come back to the table, talk to us, take another look at this. Don't just say you're going to block it because we think this is probably good for everyone. So what's your, what's your sense? If you had to put a bet on it today, what's, would you bet that this is going to pass and they will merge and it will go ahead? Or do you think it'll get kiboshed like it did a few years back? So if you'd asked me that yesterday, uh, when I was doing the research, I, I would have said it probably, I, I would put it more likely that it would pass. Yeah. Um, I think they've got a relatively strong argument and, you know, the murmurings are that the CMA may look slightly more favorably on this deal than they have on certain deals in the past. But then I started looking into, I started looking into this market. And so a lot of the argument for this, this, this combination is, look, two subscale businesses, we can't operate independently. We need to team up together in order to share resources, right? But actually, in this industry, resource sharing already happens. Right. So, so co-location is a big thing in this biz, in this industry. Basically, sharing infrastructure. So, mobile phone operators will team up together to share their masts and their cell sites. So they're already doing these deals mm. to kind of benefit from shared capacity, which slightly, not completely, but slightly kind of undermines the argument that they need to merge together in order to do this kind of stuff, you know, in order to realize these economies of scale, in order to realize these synergies. So whether the CMA lands on the side of, you know, actually better three big beasts than, you know, three big beasts and a subscale beast. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I'm, you know, I'm on the fence, 50-50, you know, come back to me yeah. in, a, in a year's time, because it will take a year plus probably to go through. Right. Yeah. I was going to ask on time scale. So yeah, maybe a year, 18 months. So fi maybe finally then 51% Vodafone, 49% Hutchinson. So why the, why those numbers? Should we be reading anything into that? Yeah. So there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, so the first is, so the first is that Vodafone also, they, they, they slightly want to be the senior partner because well, they have an option that if the business, the combined business, reaches a certain enterprise value, they have the option to buy the whole thing. Okay. So if the business exceeds an enterprise value of 16.5 billion, which is not kind of inconceivable, they get the right to buy the whole business after three years. So they already kind of want to be the senior party in this. They're a slightly bigger network in the UK. They're yeah. actually putting in a little bit more equity as well. 
So there's, there's that argument that they should be the senior party, but also from a national security perspective, right. it is seen as quite important that a critical piece of British infrastructure yeah. is owned, you know, from a percentage ownership and a control perspective by a UK PLC. So we're still in this Huawei national security, let's try and make it as easy as possible to get this deal through, hence we'll make Vodafone the senior party. And I think it makes sense for a number of other reasons as well. Okay. Interesting stuff. Uh, we shall track that story. As you said, it could be rolling for many, many months, a year plus. Um, so we'll keep track of this as things play out. Uh, let's move on to our final, final topic. And um, well, let's talk Subway. Did you know, fun fact, there are 37,000 Subway branches globally. Um, that's a lot of that's a lot of one foot sandwiches that are getting sold there. Um, so talk talk us talk, talk to us. What's going on? There's there's a buyout yeah. in the offing. Yeah, so Subway's up for sale. Um, Subway's up for sale. Uh, JP Morgan is leading the sell side process uh, mm -hmm. to sell Subway. They initially wanted ten billion dollars for the organisation, but they're now aiming to reach about nine billion dollars. Um, there are a lot of private equity firms sniffing around. Uh, the first round saw 20 PE firms interested. The way that a process like this will work is that you winnow it down, 20 down to five to a preferred and then exclusive and then you and then you get the transaction. So from 20, we now have four or five uh, private equity firms that are interested in buying this company. This company is a really interesting one. Obviously, we all know it from, you know, from virtually every high street, but it is not just, it's a franchise all. So it doesn't run the company. It doesn't run the stores. It is a franchise or that provides material, expertise, brand, uh, marketing to individuals that want to set up and the franchisee pays a franchise fee uh, to set up 10 to 15K. It's actually really quite low compared to a McDonald's or something like that. So, yeah. know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then they pay 12.5% of gross sales minus tax every week back up to Subway. Right? So Subway, the business model, you know, a franchise business model is quite a nice one if it works. You're up there, you're doing the marketing, you're giving the importance, you're helping stores upgrade, you're making sure that quality standards are uniform, but you're not actually taking on the risk of an individual store. Oh. Yeah. That's the franchisee. And you get these nice royalty payments, franchise payments every single week, filtering up the stuff. So it's an interesting business model. And it's important, this business model, because it goes into how this thing is going to be financed. So, so when private equity firms or you know, any acquirers are looking at buying an asset, buying a business, they have a range of options available to them in terms of how to finance this. And we've spoken previously on the pod about the blend of debt and equity, and you want, you know, you possibly want as much uh, as much debt as possible so that your equity can be multiplied uh, upon exit. But actually, the reality of a capital structure is much more complicated. So the way it works is it's all about risk of return. So at the very, very top of a capital structure, when I say capital structure, basically the 100% of financing that goes into a business, at the very, very top, the most risky form of capital that you can put into a business is ordinary equity. The reason why that's most risky is because if a company goes bust, they are the last people to get the dregs of the business, right? They are paid out the last. So that is proper risk capital. Right down at the bottom of the spectrum, the most secured, the most safe capital is what we would call senior secured lending. This is where a bank or an institution lends to a company 
but is secured on the assets that that company has. A bit like taking out a mortgage. You know, the bank lends me money, but they are secured against the value of my property. So I'm pretty safe. You know, I don't get a great deal of upside. The equity owners get the big upside if this thing goes, um, goes into space, go, you know, grows very quickly, but I'm pretty safe. And then all the way in between, you have these different levels of risk and return, you know, from senior secured all the way to like common, common stock, ordinary equity. And why this is important for the subway story is because they have got a really interesting source of revenues that can be what we call securitized. So the article that came out in Bloomberg a couple of days ago was about this thing called whole business securitization. And the fact that uh, potential buyers of Subway can get access to up to $3 billion out of the $9 billion purchase price in whole business securitization. What this means is that banks will lend to these private equity firms, these private equity buyers, banks will lend at, based on the royalty payments or the franchise payments that are filtering up to the business. So every week, there is some certainty that these 37,000 stores are going to pay 12.5%. That's the thing that can be securitized by at a bank, you know, I've got access to that security. I'm pretty confident that that thing is going to get given. And if, it's, and if Subway goes bust, I still get those fees coming to me as a business. Yeah. So I can lend you a lot more than you would otherwise be lent because I've got security through those royalty streams. Whole business securitization doesn't exist outside of a kind of royalty fee model. You can have secured businesses, but this notion of whole business securitization is quite unique. Um, and why it's quite an interesting story when we're trying to learn a little bit more about capital structure. So can I ask then, so that sounds like, so let's just take that franchisee who's operating their business, you know, they're at the coal face, you know, customer facing, coming in, trying to sell sandwiches, whatever, right? But they, so they're a business, like a normal business, they're generating sales and, and revenue and a portion of that's getting sent up to find the, the, the subway business. What's, but I don't understand, like from a bank who's lending, why would they see that royalty fee? Why is that less risky than a normal company's revenue and therefore profits? Well, is it just because there's a, you've got 37,000 of them, so perhaps the risk is therefore diluted. Is that how it works? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. It's quite a tough one to unpack. So mm. if I was a bank and I was looking at these royalty payments, I would see the agreement between the franchisee, the individual store, and the franchisor as an asset. Yeah. That long-term yeah. agreement, five to 10 years, 12.5%, you know, relatively stable income streams across the 37,000 portfolio, as I could see that as an asset, I would be willing to lend against. Yeah. So that if the top co went bust, I still can get that revenue stream because those companies are still existing underneath, right? So the kind of the risk is certainly spread and yeah. the contract length is quite visible. So there's visibility of income. And what you're essentially doing is you are packaging millions of Subway customers yeah. into, 30, into 37,000 like consistent revenue streams. As a bank, I would feel so much more confident lending against than lending against the two and a half million you know, buyers of a Subway sandwich every lunch. So it's just a different risk profile. Uh, and it, has, it mirrors a little bit of the mortgage-backed securities right. you know, kind of combinations that we saw uh, back in the dark days, pre-2008. So I guess then, thinking back to your capital structure, then this this comes, it's more down towards the sort of senior secured debt end of the spectrum. And therefore, I would assume then that the interest rate on that loan is lower. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you will be able to potentially borrow more. 
Right. So, so uh, the article goes, there's potentially up to 3 billion available in whole business securitization and an additional 2 billion available in traditional bonds and loans. So you're right. getting five ninths of your capital structure potentially in debt. Yeah. And actually, weirdly enough, just to kind of move, move this onto the second interesting part of the story, that 5 billion number is the amount of money that JP Morgan, remember JP Morgan is advising Subway, not advising the buyers, is the amount of money that JP Morgan is offering as what's called staple or bridge financing. So this is a really common thing in private equity or in deal making in general. If I'm a bank with a big balance sheet acting on behalf of Subway and we wanna get this sale done by July, I can sweeten it by saying, you're buying Subway, but you're also buying this $5 billion financing package that we as JP Morgan have bespokely put together for you for this acquisition. So the buyers don't need to scramble around, certainly for the first year, thinking about that $5 billion. They just buy Subway and have the debt that's already arranged. And then JP Morgan can work with the eventual buyer to see how to, you know, maybe turn that into a longer term debt instrument or, or whatever it might be. It's really, so, really smart. It's, so there's no like, half of me wants to say, well, hang on, isn't there a bit of a conflict of interest there where JP Morgan want to get this deal done ASAP, really because of the fees they'll generate from the financing product, which the buyers are going to be paying for. And, and therefore, a bit of a conflict maybe in terms of representing Subway, the seller. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. And you'll find this all the way through corporate finance. Um, and and, and you, may not, you may not call it an explicit conflict of interest, but the best representation of this kind of packaged offering is if you work for a big lender that isn't an amazing M&A advisor, you might well get a little ticket on the M&A deal you know, not right at the top as the lead arranger, but maybe, you know, somewhere, you know, a little, a little tombstone for your work, even if your M&A team didn't do a great deal. It's because you're the biggest lender in the syndicate. So, you know, there is a little, well, there's definitely overlap. Right? If yeah. I provide you the financing, I want to get a bit of advisory fee. If I'm going to be the lead advisor, well, why don't I help lead the, you know, the, the financing as well? So it, it's not necessarily a conflict of interest, but there's certainly, yeah. JP Morgan is going to, benefit both from the advisory the arrangement of the debt and then working with the buyer to sell down the debt and restructure it afterwards so they've, they've got a nice ticket here they do and i guess yeah i mean thinking back to like competition uh commissions and stuff it's almost like jp morgan i mean we're going veering off into a different conversation here so we won't go down this path but jp morgan they're such a beast that you know they do have maybe that power to kind of demand whatever fees they want right because there's just no one else as big as them that can kind of pull off these deals and i guess for subway thinking about the competition uh sorry the the the, the that, that point about them um the conflict of interest point maybe i guess for subway the attraction is we want to just get this deal done we want to get it done now we've decided to sell let's sell and right if if jp morgan can provide that financing bridge it just speeds up the deal i guess so that's yeah, the attractive yeah, I, I'd be more likely to go if I wanted a relatively quick, efficient yeah. process. Why not go with JP Morgan if they're going to provide the stable financing? Obviously, yeah. JP is not the only organization that does this, but they're certainly certainly too big to fail, as as we've discussed before. Uh, who owns Subway now? Is it? Uh, yeah, who who's the current owner? Is it a public no. listed or is it? It's not publicly listed. No. Uh, it's private equity backed. Okay, so it is private equity backed. Just wanting to. Um, cash in on uh well it's time to exit and return funds i guess so they're just kind of rolling it over to a new set of private equity firms i see um it's actually see. owned by the deluca family so it's kind of privately owned oh okay fine okay not private fine. equity but privately owned so they obviously yeah. want to cash out yeah it's just time yeah cool well very interesting uh so next time i step into a subway um which I confess I don't do on a regular basis, but um, I'll ask the uh, I'll ask the the franchise 
owner not that i'm sure they won't be behind the, the counter but maybe they will i'll ask them i wonder what the franchise owner thinks about all of this i guess for them it doesn't really matter right who the who the big boss is upstairs you just got to send the money yeah could not care less could yeah. not care less yeah cool it's very interesting stuff well thanks very much for your for your insights and um we'll leave it there for this week's uh deal room episode and We'll be back uh, next week for, for more interesting insights. Thanks very much, Stephen. Take care. Cool. Thank you, Piers.